Hello and welcome to this week's Talking Wealth podcast. I'm Dale Gillam, the Chief Analyst here at Wealth Within. Today we're going to get into the second part of our podcast that we did um, roughly around the golden rules to creating wealth. I know we did quote my three rules for creating wealth in the first podcast, but it was so much more than that about what our objective is about trying to retire on, on a balanced or have a balance out our lifestyle on retirement and how we get to retirement with plenty of money that will fund our lifestyle. But before we get too far into this second part of the podcast, I need to introduce my co-host, Janine Cox. How are you? Great. Thanks. I've just had lunch, so always good on a full belly. You're telling me that because we're going to hear noises and stuff <laughs> over from your side of the table. No, the noises are only when I've got an empty stomach. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm just wondering, you know, so you don't get, you know, as you get older, you get like more what sensitive. What sort of noises are we talking about here? Oh, I don't know, but I'm not, I'm just being tactful at the moment. <laughs> yeah, thank you. At the moment. <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> I'm not always tactful, but that's fair enough too. <laughs> now, last time, the first part of this podcast, um, which was over an hour, I think, well over, well mm. over an hour actually, was always about a lot of people get to retirement. We know most people don't retire on anywhere near a comfortable sort of lifestyle. Mm. Um, and they live on a government pension or that part of their pension is part of their retirement plan, which we talked about is not a very good strategy, but it was more about sort of the what and where they are, the reality yeah. check of yeah, where they are. So if they haven't good. watched it, that or listened to that podcast, go back and listen to it because, again, yeah, it's we're... It's important for everybody to have one, isn't it? A it is. You've got to have a plan. You know, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And, and I think mm. most people fail their way to retirement, mm. basically, because they sort of ignore it until the last minute and then they go, oh, shit, it's not going to happen. Yes. It's not the level that I thought I would get to when I was 20 when I started work or whatever age you start work at. And it's going to mm. be increasingly important, I think, in the next few years mm. because we could be back to where we were pre the GFC. Ooh, you're trying to scare In terms everybody. of where things are headed. Mm. Well, they are. I think it's it's critical anybody under 30 knows this stuff and mm. does this stuff, not just, oh, that's interesting, you know, and then do nothing about it till they're 60. Um, those people that are already 60, it's a bit, I won't say it's too late for them. You can always, 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 always do something. Mm. But I think for our children and, and the ones that have been born nowadays, it's so critical that we, really teach them good money habits and, and how to build wealth for themselves because it's just getting harder and harder every year. So yeah, we are, again, recording this on video. So if you are listening to this. Remember, you said you were going to stop saying it's getting harder and harder. No, it has People. been getting harder and harder and harder. And I'm, I'm assuming we're going to keep using that message. Uh, that's what I'm saying is, mm. you know, because, you know, we – as a society, we keep telling young people it's too hard. That's right. You know, and why do we keep doing that? So, um, mm. but – we are recording this again on video, so if you are listening to this as an audio in your car or on the way home to work or to work or on your morning walk or whatever that is, you need to head over to to YouTube and go to Wealth Within TV on YouTube and you'll see the recording because we've got a lot more um, PowerPoints and charts and websites to show you, so it'll really, really help you. Yeah, that's important. If you're listening to it on the audio, go and check out the YouTube um a recording so you can really get the full effect of or the full benefit of what we're going to mm. be talking a bit about today. So, um, but as I said last time, we talked a bit about this, well, you know, what are the objective was, you know, and yep. really, so if we're getting into this part two, the, the objective for us was really um, to help people understand where they're at. And that's why we sort of gave people a reality check on their investments. But the plan was really to, or the objective was to retire with a, um, mm on, I won't say an existence or a livable lifestyle, but a, more of a comfortable lifestyle. So the plan was to build up their income stream mm. big enough that they would fund their... And have the income coming from and, different sources. Yeah, correct. So we did talk about last time that most people are on a wage or a fixed sort of income, mm. which they can you know, have incrementally go at, grow, grow as they get older, I mean, wage raises mm. and new jobs and stuff like that. But basically people spend most of their money and then they have that superannuation that they rely on, which, again, we have a big talk about that one, didn't we, or the compulsory superannuation. But the plan from here is this podcast is all about how to do that. So we're going to give you another plan, and this one's a real simple one. Basically, your income obviously should go to your expenses. Then you've got your compulsory superannuation, which we talked about, that mm -hmm. everybody has as soon as you've got a job. But what we're adding into that is is a savings component or investing component. And to me, that's critical 
that mm. people should, no matter how old you are, should always have that part of it. Do you want to talk about some of the experiences you've had around all that? Well, you said 20% of income I echo, I did. going in. And can you just explain why you chose that figure? I chose it because it's people can do that. Mm. If I'd said 30 or 40 people go, oh, I can't do that. Mm. 20% is manageable in most people's minds. The more, the better. I would put 30 or 40% if mm. I could, but 10% is not enough. You know, yeah. yeah, we've got whatever is going into compulsory super. But to me, I forget about that in terms of I don't – deem that as part of my retirement and I've changed my thinking and, and a lot of people, they don't. They think, well, okay, my superannuation super, and the it, government's going to look after me mm. and it doesn't. We've proven that time and time and time again. You don't have to look at all the statistics mm. on the ABS website. As people well, they're struggle. now saying that you need around a million to have mm. And we're not really getting that. And we'll show people that anyway. We'll show people the actual mm. figures of people, what, they get in their, what they're getting now in retirement with superannuation. But to me, it's critical that you put away some of your money. Yep, definitely. From day That's one. That's without question. So, and I know you've talked a bit about your family, how your child, you know, you put mm. money away all the time and people, some parents do that. Mm. But I, from the day you start work, you should be putting money away. Um, and I talk about 20% and, and I know I get people go, oh, Dale, I can't, I can't put 20% away. But that, that'll be more obviously for the younger the person is because they don't have the overheads and the expenses. That's for everybody. That, I don't care whether you're a pensioner. Mm. Well, probably that's probably too extreme. If you're working, you should be able to put 20% of your income Look, away. Look, I always said to young people who were still getting mm. pocket money or they had a part-time job, mm. they should be able to put 50% of what they're Correct. earning away. Because mum and dad are paying for everything else. Yep. But if you're if you're working, you should be able to put twenty percent of your income away to invest in. Mm. And people go, but Dale, I've got kids, we've got this, we've got that. Your choices determine where you spend your money. Mm -hmm. So you've where you are today is exactly where you chose to be. So if you don't have spare cash and everything's going out in expenses, then mm. something's wrong. So there's either two ways to fix that. One is reduce your expenses. Second is earn more income. And the third is to do both. Mm -hmm. I'd rather do both. Yep. So how do you get more income? And we talked a bit about that last time about having mm -hmm. shares, property, business, yep. royalty incomes or other types of um, passive income streams. And we talked mm -hmm. about a couple of those. But I've never met somebody that we can't find money and whether it's they're overpaying an interest because they've got four credit cards to the mm -hmm. max, whether they've got two cars and they don't need it. Loans. Loans. Bills. Bills. You mm. know, they've got subscriptions to Netflix and 6,000 other things. You know, there's so many different ways to not reduce somebody's lifestyle mm. but make it more effective for them so that they're achieving their goals. And so, and again, it really is just about writing down what you do and then allocating it to what's important and you making those positive choices rather than... I mean, there are always going to be fixed costs that you can't change. Yeah, you've got to pay. You know, mm. you've got to pay your mortgage and you've got mm. to pay for your electricity or your, otherwise you're sitting in the dark with no food. Yeah. Um, that sort of stuff. So I understand all of that, but, and sometimes those decisions are really tough. Mm. And I know I've had people. What, have, not have that cup of coffee? Well, I'm not even talking about that. I've had people come to me, you know, prior to Wealth Within and what we do, they were just like, they had no money. They were in their fifties or sixties. They've got no money and they, you know, the husband and wife work. And I've had that, this sort of situation numerous times, but they'd, and I go, let's start writing. And we'd write all the where they put their money, where their money's going. And I went, okay, so what is it in this list of expenses is if you don't have it, you die, basically. You don't have a house, you don't have food, and you don't have those basic stuff. So we put those aside, okay, because they are critical for you to um, be there. So there's, as I said, mortgage, rent. Um, gas, electricity, that sort of stuff. But then there's all the stuff that's like really important for you, which could be, un, um, let's say, new shoes or mm. shoes or something like that. But and we're not talking about overdoing the shoes. No. But, uh, but then it's something like mobile phone, which is mm. not necessary. If you don't need your mobile phone for a job, you don't need a mobile phone. But you do need a mobile phone these days. No, you don't. You just need to look at what plan you've got. No, no, but I'm just saying you don't. Anybody, I can I, I can challenge you, you don't need a mobile phone. Unless you need it for work, you don't need a mobile phone. I'm not going to sit here and get into a debate with you no. about whether you need a mobile phone. I'm but saying you don't. You're not, I, you are not going to die. What I'm saying is you're not going to die phone. if you don't have a mobile phone. That's different. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. I said you, unless you absolutely have to have that mm -hmm. thing to do work and earn an income from, mm -hmm. you don't need it. So it could be a car. 
if you can catch a bus or catch a tram to work. That's smart. You don't need a car. Mm. And that car could then free up tens of thousands of dollars mm. that may be loans or maybe uh, a maintenance, you know, $1,000, 2000 a year of maintenance, petrol, blah, blah, blah. Catch the tram or the bus to work or the train. So unless it's involved in creating an income for you or m- sustaining your life, I wonder if a lot of people important. post-COVID are going back to the trains and trams well, now. Well, they haven't been. But the point is, I'm saying is mm. that's where you really you need to make those tough decisions to get that, free up that 20%. Yep. So, And I've had people in my office, you know, before Wealth Within, they were sort of in tears because of the situation they put themselves in. Mm. I said, but your decisions got you there. And they go, Mm. yeah, I I realise that. And I said, so what decisions are we going to make today? Because Mm. you obviously want to do something. Yes. And they go, yeah. And I said, okay, so which tough decision are you going to make? Mm. You know, is it? What um, are the options? What are your options? Get rid of your mobile phone if Mm. you don't need to get rid of your car, second car if you don't need to get rid of, you know, your golf membership, whatever that stuff is. is Let's get everything under control. Do you look at the easy ones first or the big numbers first? You look at the. Both, actually. You look at ones like negative debt, which are credit cards, mm-hmm. um, car loans, those sorts of stuff. Stuff that it's, you know, anywhere between 10 and 25% interest rates. Yeah. When we start looking at those and we looked at the interest people were paying, once you got rid of those, they had a shed load of money for Yeah, it would free up a lot. It mm. was so powerful doing that with people on a piece of paper and a calculator mm. with their bank statement saying, this is how much interest you're paying. Mm. And we can just do a little bit of a redraw out of your housing loan, pay all of those off, cut your credit mm. cards up, and immediately you have two, four, five, six hundred dollars a month or a week, whatever the figure is. But That's we great. can't then put that into spending more on other stuff that has mm. to go off reducing your mortgage or going into investment, one of the two. Yep. Uh, and so that's why we talked about tough decisions. Mm. And I know it sounds a bit hard, but again, people get themselves into these situations, but there's always a way out of the situation if you do it in the cold light of day and yep. you're prepared to be open and then make some of those tough decisions because mm-hmm. sometimes the decision will cause short-term discomfort, meaning you know, you're going to have to catch a train to well, work. Well, I saw an article on um, Yahoo mm. and it was mm. it was to the American market, but still mm. the the... Um, same principles apply here. Yeah, and correct. they were saying, well, look, can you actually retire in 10 years if you had nothing today? Absolutely, you can. And, yeah, it was, that, was, that was the comment from the article, but mm-hmm. it was all about cutting back and, and being extremely tough. And I, making I disagree the, with that. Making the goal that, you know, that you can just being re- – because mm-hmm. you were talking about just looking at the bare essentials correct. and cutting back on what you need yeah. to cut back. But we're talking about a really interesting goal here of 10 years – Mm-hmm. and they've got nothing behind them. So the first thing they've got to do is be able to save some money so that they can invest it. So where are they going to get that money in looking at what they can free up from yep. their from their budget? Um, and that's, that. like you say, it is a tough thing to do. But the fact that somebody has done the, the calculations and has looked at how someone yeah. can just change their life in 10 years. Mm-hmm. But admittedly, they did say in the article that, that would they would be mm-hmm. not living a lavish lifestyle or anything no, like that. No, it's not. But the thing is, I was talking about people who were in a dire situation financially, how we could mm. free up money for them and make those decisions. And, yeah, that does involve in getting getting rid of something because you never get something unless you give something mm. up. So, but I did say there are three ways to fix your problem. Mm. Reduce expenses, increase income, or do both. Mm-hmm. So do both. Mm. So why is it they're always saying all on TV like, you know, here, save money on your car, save money on your gas bill, save mm. money on your phone bill, save money on this. It's always about saving money. And to me, that's a negative mindset. Yeah. Okay. I'd go, well, how do you make more money? Mm. What can you do? Mm. You know, can you open up, uh, go onto eBay and start going to op shops and sell stuff, buy stuff and sell it on eBay? Can you, um, you know, you know, like I mentioned on the first, last podcast, mm. can you create a, a, an e-type book and sell it through Apple Books or Amazon and for five bucks or ten bucks yep. and get that income coming through because it was just a cool book. That or start you did. something on YouTube. Or start something on YouTube and get advertising from YouTube because you do or mm. do some stupid dances on TikTok and get them to pay you, whatever it is. Mm. There are so many ways you can make money nowadays to increase your income, but you also got to look at it saying, well, what's an acceptable level of expense mm-hmm. and lifestyle expense? And so 
that's where the tough decisions come in. So to me, I always do those three things is either increase your income, decrease your cost or do both and do both is the Just answer. looking at your shopping list is pretty a quick thing to do. Yeah. Mm. You know, instead of buying the most expensive stuff, buy some stuff that's a bit cheaper, not necessarily terrible, but you know what I mean? It's, it's about having that plan. Mm. And so, again, going back to our plan is obviously we want to increase our income and that is obviously we can ask the boss for a rise, but half the time we're going to get knocked back. Maybe not. Yeah, because they need if if they're not going forward mm. and they're going backwards. Correct. Then they need to free up some of the expenses so that they can mm. actually put it into positive areas that are going to provide more investment income. Mm. Yeah. So if your all the money you come comes in the door for you with your wage just goes into expenses, then you're not really getting mm. hit. And yeah, and as I said earlier, to me superannuation is just a bonus. Yep. You know, and to me that's why you should, if you treat it like it's just a bonus, if it's there at the end, it's fine, mm. then you'll plan more and you'll do better. So everybody, I think, you know, and I know that, that anybody can free up 20%. To put oh, into I've investing. seen some amazing single mums just correct. get their budget together and decide Seriously what correct. they're going to do, start yep. saving really hard and looking at all of that sort of stuff and end up amassing a few properties. Well, we had a single mum with a disabled child who did our course and mm. the things that she was doing was mm. just Blew me away. Mm. And, you know, and she had a severely, she had a, a, a not a severely, a high. Needs. She, no, she had an autistic child who mm. was high needs, mm. not not high functioning. That's, I didn't want to say the wrong yeah. thing. High needs. And I rang her one day and I said, I, you have so much respect for me because you're a single mum and you're dealing with this, mm. but you're doing all these things because you didn't want to be a victim of mm. society or didn't want to settle for just average. And I think, you know, we, we don't amazing. have to take that. And so that was amazing. So let's move on. So we've got a bit of the plan. So we're now going to ask somebody what their future looks like. And I know we did bring that up a little bit in the last podcast. Mm. We need to look at that. So do you want to take people through this? Because I know this is one of your great areas. Yeah, well, so goals, mm. goal setting is a, mm. always an interesting area for people because not everybody naturally wants to mm. or knows how to set goals properly. So... We do this with all students, everyone that comes through, and then we reinforce it in the support service that we provide as well in getting them to make sure they've documented their current ones. But we find that a lot of people, when they write goals, they write them in a way. And some people would even, we say to them, look at the language that you're using when you're writing your goals. Keep it really simple, be specific, and it's got to have, you know, like a clear um, plan or target or whatever it is Mm. that you're aiming for has got to be completely clear and achievable. And to, once you get that down, it just sets the roadmap for everything else. That's re- really a part of it. But mm. in addition to that, over the top, think of it like an umbrella. It's almost mm. like your goal, which is not a dream. The ultimate goal is whatever it is that you're wanting out of that. Mm. So what when we talk to our traders, it's obviously about what is the trading going to bring them. Not, for initially, when you speak to people, they say, oh, it's I want to make, you know, $100,000 or whatever it is out of trading or want to make $20,000. Yeah. And I want to trade every day or I want to trade like this. And, you know. Yeah, but then they work through all of that and then mm. start to put together a proper little vision for themselves. Mm. It only needs to be a couple of sentences that they put down to say what their life's going to be like and it could mm. be five years, ten years' time, whatever they think mm. the time frame is, and then work backwards and start to document those goals that, mm. um, you know, will help them get that. So... Some people might have goals to be able to retire early, but some people, like you say, don't want to retire early. They they really enjoy doing what they're doing. A few people are that. It's part of their purpose in life to be doing that. Well, we all need to be, and there's stages of retirement. Um, You know, and the first one is is holiday phase, which lasts twelve months. But then after that, you try to well, what's my what's my worth? Where am I? Where am Mm. I getting self worth from? And that's why a lot of people in retirement will do charity work. Yeah, they don't necessarily work full time. They might work part time. Yeah. And that's not just people in retirement. When, when we think mm. of retirement, unfortunately, a lot of people are thinking so far down the track instead of bringing it back. Like you mentioned in the other podcast we did, I think was it Tightward Todd? Yeah. The no, money no, coach. no, Aaron and Annie. Aaron and Annie. Oh, I was thinking of Tightward Todd because mm. I can remember he... He didn't write a book. He actually <laughs> had a... Was yet, it anyway. him that had the plan that um, when he hit 35, I think it was him. Yeah, it was him. And so he was going to retire at 35 mm. and he did. Mm. And it was all because he put this, you know, goals together, had his vision of what he wanted, put the plan together. And then he, then he said that when he got to 35 and he realised that he'd actually achieved it, then he had no one to play with. No one to play with, yeah. <laughs> Because he, he was the only one who had done it. So all his friends mm. were out working. But his so. name is Tidewad. 
Yeah, tight water time. <laughs> <laughs> but it is true. I mean, you know, people, you, you, how people think really changes how they do their goals. Mm. And we do see it all the time. I'm working with somebody now in our mentoring service. Once they hit module four of our diploma, you get to be mentored, basically. Oh, well, not basically. You get to be mentored. And the first part of it is that we send two documents and one is about what's your why mm. and the second one is about creating your portfolio and having your portfolio plan or your investment strategy and everything else that we talk about. about. And the what's your why, we get so many people that don't know how to set goals or don't understand how to find their why. Mm. And I'm working with this guy at the moment and, you know, it's very external what he's talking about, mm. not internal. Look, I can understand that because I've done the really same sort hard. of thing in the past. It's, you know, it's like when you're writing it, it's actually being able to see what it is and the way that you're writing it mm. is not necessarily going to help mm. you, you know. So you have to actually come around to mm. um, writing these things differently. Yeah. It's the same with some of the stuff that the students were sending in when they're writing their, oh, yeah. their whys. Yeah. They're not writing their vision. They're actually saying, oh, maybe if and then going into a whole lot of stuff about I'll what, try to do this what and they this happens, could do, do or what might happen or, and rather than actually having put the glasses on and mm. see yourself in five years. Don't just sort of write. Well, that's what I did in, in terms of, and I, yeah. some of these people I actually say, I, I mean, I wrote a journal and I wrote a whole mm. story in the journal of my life and, yeah. it was, and I made it as colourful uh, as I could and as detailed as I could with feelings and emotions and everything in it because... Until you really get that happening, just, mm. they're just wish list all the time. And it's amazing how quick you get that stuff mm. when you start to focus on them. But it's, it's and if people don't to want do. to put it in words, that vision board we were talking about mm, in the is pod, really yeah. good as well. Mm. Yeah. So basically, you've got to get your goals. Now, goal, you know, having a goal. Goal is a four letter word, and it starts with <laughs> G. And it's not a bad word, but it's a good one. You've got to have your goals, and you have to have them written down. Yep. So that could be on your vision board. It could mm. be. And somewhere where you're going to see it. And regularly. somewhere where you're going to see it. And I know every time I write goals down, and I can just write them down and I come back a year mm. later and I go, oh, we've ticked all those well, off. And I've never seen it between writing them down and, and picking the piece of paper up again. Mm. I've had them on my wind, you know, mirrors when I'm shaving, you know. I've had them in drawers. I've had them in books, you know, my car, my journals. Mm. I've had them all over the place. And the scary thing about goals is when you write them down, they actually happen. Yeah. So what are you afraid of? I know. I mean, there was a scenario. And what are you waiting for? The scenario for me where we, we'd we actually bought, had an investment mm -hmm. property and then mm -hmm. we'd always thought, well, it would be great if the one next door came up mm -hmm. for sale. And it just so happened that the tenant was moving out of the one that we owned. Otherwise, yeah. I would never have known because I'd been searching online, keeping an eye yeah. on it. And for whatever reason, those particular months, I just took my eye off it because I was working on other things. And it came up. And I saw the sign out the front and I thought, oh. Wow, if I hadn't have driven up the street and this, had, this tenant hadn't have been moving out, I would have missed it. And so, yeah, it's just yeah. sometimes you yeah. just put plant the seed, you have the plan. Mm. If it comes to, to it, you actually got to have a backup plan because we actually had an alternative plan mm. if that didn't, if that never came up. But you just still have in to have case. a plan because mm. if you plan to fail, you, if you don't well, right. fail to plan, you plan to fail. Yes. Um, and the thing and is. And the is, universe is amazing in terms of helping just, you know. But what are, but Places, I have people. events, time. Well, they are, correct. You know, totally, you, you attract those things too. But what do you say to somebody, and I've had people say to me, oh, if I set goals, what if I don't get them, I feel like a failure. Mm. What would you say to them? Gosh, I'd say push past that fear. Mm. Get your cowboy boots or your big boy boots well, If your goal is to make $10 million and you get to five, you're not going to be upset, are you? No, Even exactly. though you've got 50% of your goal. Well, that's the problem with goals, isn't it? Mm. So the traditional sense of a goal is that you write the goal, you make it so specific, mm -hmm. and then if you don't get it, what then? Well, they, they don't tell you. A lot of places don't. don't actually tell you me, what you do goals then. Goals are fluid. You change them That's all the right. time. You update them and, and the more you learn, you the more to, you do, the more mm, you can do. So to me, you just keep the fluid. Steering the it's ship, a fluid isn't it? document, yep. you know. Like my first goal when I – I bought this poster when I was really young, like 18, 19, and it was a poster, mm -hmm. big poster, and it had a picture of a BMW – a gold mm. Amex card and a bottle of Perrier on it. Wow. It's a pretty popular poster you can find in places. And I went. Was it the BMW that you liked the most? Well, and the gold Amex card. <laughs> um, I've never had a BMW. I don't like them. As soon as mm. I drove them, I didn't like them. So I don't have one. I've had a gold Amex card. Mm. I got rid of it after I got it. It mm. was expensive to have and it's a status mm. symbol, but right. get rid of it. And 
I've drunk some Perrier, but I just like sparkly water. <laughs> so, but could I? Can I have all of those? Yes. Actually, that's interesting that you say it. And yes, and where did it go? What the Perrier? Yeah. Down in my mouth. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> it went down the sewage eventually. <laughs> but the thing is, is can I afford all of those things? Yeah, mm. I can. So it's not the actual item. It's it was the feeling that I that's had fantastic. if I had the ability to have those things. Mm. So whilst it was a nice BMW and has nice having an AMS card and flashing that, well, mm. who cares? Just the standard Visa or MasterCard is <laughs> fine. It still pays for the stuff as long as you pay it off. So yep. basically the point is, is obviously set your goals, make them real for you, but they're fluid. I thought you were going to ask down. me what was on my bedroom wall. Well, it wasn't, you know, what is it, Leif Garrett or something like that, some <laughs> sexy no. young dude or whatever, I don't know. Um, oh, no, you're not that old, are you? Horses, which I horses. did have. Yeah. So I've had a, I've had a mm. number of horses and... I know it um, wasn't a picture of me because we hadn't met then. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was actually um, rock stars. Probably. So, yeah. and I've seen, I've been to every concert, like all of, of the rock stars that I've had on my wall, I've You've been to every concert, yeah. Oh, I hardly had any posters on my wall anyway. But anyway, so write down your goals, have a plan. Not every concert for every band that I had on the wall, but you know what, I've been to at least once. Of one, one of everyone. <laughs> I wasn't that big a groupie. <laughs> I'll let you get away with that. All Thank right. you. So golden rule number one we talked about in our last podcast was spend less than you earn. So mm. what we do here is obviously um, we want to do one of those three things, increase income, reduce expenses, or do both of those. So golden rule right. spend less than you earn means you either need to create some multiple streams of income mm. or you reduce, you do your budgeting and what we talked about. So that's one of the things you need to do. So we've talked about freeing up cash flow through budgeting. We're talking about freeing up 20%. So this yep. is all part of golden rule number one in spending less than you earn. So it's being a, being aware of what comes in and what goes out. If what comes in is not enough, make that bigger. If what okay, goes so out is too big, make that smaller. So how do you, how do you bring leveraging into that? Oh, Ooh. that could be another podcast. Okay. Reducing negative debt mm. is the third point on this one. So, and we've talked a bit about that. So if you have multiple credit cards, I don't understand why anybody needs multiple credit cards unless one for business, one for personal, that's yeah, it. Yeah, yep. I don't understand that at all. Negative debt's also car loans. On your loans. house. The house is a negative debt and mm. people go, oh, you can't claim it. it. If you can't claim it on tax, it's negative. Mm. If it's a debt and it can't be claimable, it's a negative debt. So Keep it. It's that. going out, and there's nothing coming back. There's nothing coming back. <laughs> so, so reduce your housing loan, reduce your mm. personal loans, reduce your credit card loans, and get rid of them. Get down to one credit card, have a minimum limit, pay your credit card off every month. Mm. That sort of stuff is what we've talked about numerous times. So, spend less than you earn. Use your super, and use your super wisely. I know mm. some people are doing that. We've got students mm. who are using like things trading like their super, trading their super fund, and even though it's not a self-managed <laughs> super fund, because some of those super funds. Right. Are allowing people to buy and sell shares through the super fund or within mm. the super fund. I think Australian super There are does some it platforms, now. yep. Um, they're doing that. So they're actually trying to increase their return mm. rather than just toward putting it in a balanced fund or a mm -hmm. capital stable fund or whatever else. They're yep. actually trying to do better to get, uh, you know, do more. Mm -hmm. So let's move on. So what's the next bit we think? Those who are rich tend to invest first and then spend what is left whereas the poor tend to spend what they have and leave nothing to invest. So true, isn't it? So true. How many mm. times do you see that, people? They, they run out a week before the, they run out of money before they run out a week. Mm, that's sad. You know, or they're waiting for next week's pay or they're getting their boss to, you mm. know, advance them some of their pay so that they can pay their rent, that yeah. sort of stuff. And I think, wow, that's tough. how do you ever get into that situation? Mm. So, you know, to me that's, you know, and it's so true because of the people that I know, they invest first. Mm. You know, the, the people that are well off, the successful people pay, invest first because they know, well, who's the most important person? Well, they are. Yeah. Mm. So look after yourself first and then spend what's whatever's left yeah. over. So let's move on. And that leads us to this one. It's called pay yourself first. Yeah. Because can I ask you a question? Go I mean, I'm going to anyway. Are you, is the tax man more important than you? No, <laughs> no, he's not. Why not? Mm, well, he thinks he is. He thinks he is. So, is the landlord more important than you? But I no. am the landlord. Well, you are the landlord. I know that. But that's the point. It's like you're more important, or your family is more important than anybody else. So, mm. pay yourself first, and that includes the tax man. I know tax comes out of your wage before you see it, but then 
that 20% to me is gross, not net mm. of tax. Yep. So if you earn $1,000 a week gross, mm -hmm. then that's 200 bucks mm. that you put away, not net after tax because okay. that means you're paying the tax man first and you think they're more important Actually, than you. Actually, that's really good. Mm. And the tax man is not more important than you. They can wait for their money. They've got a lot of it, mm. you know, and they take a lot of it. So pay yourself first and foremost Every so allocate time. that money to your investments at the outset. Regardless of what's okay. going on, always. Yeah. And I know some people put their investing budgeting or they're you know, freeing up cash sometimes. Oh, I've got a lot of expenses happening in the next month, so I'm not going to put anything away. And the thing is you've got to avoid doing that because... See, that's where that's where an investment mm -hmm. in a property is really good for people. It's in forced savings. Yeah. Also, once they know how to trade, there are different types of leverage that they can get on shares. Correct. And, and it is for savings. It is. Mm. And thing is, I've even said that to some people is they, you know, uh, with the trying to budget, I go, okay, so you can free up 200 bucks a week. Yeah, okay, so are you going to do that every week and save up $1,000 and buy a parcel of shares? Well, yeah, I could do that, but then they're not really good at being consistent. Mm. So I said, all right, well, then how about, well, can we get a $10,000 loan and then that $200 a week pays off that? They go, yeah, okay, so it's, you're going to get a slightly less return, mm. but you're going to pay the bank back, aren't you? And they go, yeah. So it's enforced savings in that way. It's not the best way of doing it. I just thought of something. Have you ever seen a bank that, because you know how you can have an offset account and you can put cash in it? Yep. Have you ever seen a bank use shares in the same sort of way? Like why? Well, you can in margin lending and that was. No, it's margin lending, but yeah. I'm talking about against property in the same way as you can use cash against in an offset. You can use a property for investing. So whether you can get a, you can redraw off a property and put that into cash. No, I'm not oh, talking about shares. Like, so say you've got your cash sitting there in a bank account. Mm -hmm. Technically, you've got those shares sitting there working for you, capital growth and income. Mm -hmm. But imagine if get the gov the one of the banks said right we're going to help you out we've got cash here we've got shares here so we're going to actually use that as an offset process and they literally um could, I heard if that. you default they can take the shares like they've got the well as i said the only one i know of is margin lending which mm. some banks do or used to do anyway but it, I mean, in, in one sense, I don't know what the legal issues are, but imagine if they could just... Well, it's just having a power of attorney Well, if somebody, if somebody um, you know, if they've got to protect themselves, obviously. Correct, and they just so, have that margin there and they have a legal document yeah. that signs if you go into an area of default, they can mm. ask you for more money or sell up the asset to pay off Then you wouldn't loan. need a guarantor if you'd already had shares sitting there. Correct. Mm. Maybe that's a new product we can recommend know. to the banks. So now I want to go into a couple of websites in a second and I want to talk about, you know, different things about the standards of retirement, how much super you're going to need and some other insights around retirement. Because I mm -hmm. think it's critical that we focus on some of this stuff because this is the future for a lot of people. And if we don't prepare for the future, we know we're going to be there. Mm. But the, as we said last time, it's depending on what you do today determines how you get to there. But according to yeah. the Association of Superannuation Funds of Australia Limited or the ASFA, that's a big title. Australians aged between 60 and 64 have a medium balance of $178,808 for a men. Mm -hmm. So that's their super balances between, if, if you're between 60 and 64, you have, there's a median balance for 178,808 for that's men. That's bad, isn't it? That's super bad. And for women, it's 137,051. So 137,051 mm -hmm. for women. That's the median super balance for people in their 60s, 60 to 64. Yep. Now, obviously, when they retire at 65 or something, it's, you know, the top you know, end might be hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, but not those ones. So I think that's a really interesting. Yeah, that um, is interesting. It is it is so, so, so interesting that people are, and to me is, is how do you retire on that? Because if you're in a, you're retiring on that in super and super is, they roughly look at 5% growth, mm. right? And you're going to get a pension, but how long is that going to last? If we, because we talked about, Gee, not we're long. going to talk about not long at all. What people years. need, so we're going to Three bring years. up a couple of websites to show people what people need, and that's not enough, is it? If you're living on a mega, mega life, you know, well, it's more like an existence, and no wonder it? you see all this stuff on TV, well, people struggling. Like what yeah. you're saying before, I mean, they, we are seeing the mm -hmm. the average age of women around sixty five, wasn't it, and mm -hmm. men. Mm -hmm. 66 or something like that? Is it around the 60s? 
Somewhere like that, but they've raised the retirement. retirement age. I think it's 67 now, isn't it? I know, but I also found somewhere um, mm -hmm. on Australian Retirement Trust where it says the average retirement age mm -hmm. in Australia is 55. Latest consensus showed an average retirement age of 55.4, and that was according to the Australian Bureau of Statistics. So there's data mm -hmm. just de depends on what you're reading, doesn't it? It does depend on what you're reading, but what's retirement too mm. is, you know, and I don't, I dare say, We'd need to look at the criteria on that. Yep. Is retirement, they're going past Because that shows me that people are, are changing, that they're not waiting mm. to get the pension to retire. Well, that's smart. Mm. You know, if you can, re so, but that's, we're talking about this, they're saying the average person, is it? Yeah. So th there was lot, two lots of data I've just looked mm. at. So there was an article from The Age where it says in Melbourne, the average age of retirement for women last year was 65.1. Yeah. Um, up 3.7 years since 2002 and 66.7 years for men, up 2.9 years since 2002. So it's got worse. So that's the age. And then, as I said, Australian Retirement Trust's got one there. The average retirement age in Australia is 55, so 0.4. So I'm not sure what How they got that. where that's come from or if it's old information. Well, let me have a look. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote a web, CanStar. So canstar.com.au, great website. Mm. Um, I know we contribute articles to them and they have this thing called average super balance by age, okay? So they're talking about different gender men and women and obviously age brackets 30, 40, 50, 60. So they're saying men age 30 have an average balance of $27,182, mm. but the balance they require today for having a comfortable retirement is actually 61000 Yep. So a 30-year-old males today in Australia, uh, what the gap is 33,818. So they're behind 33,818. Okay. For uh, ladies or women for 30, they're behind 38,150 because their average balance is 22,850 when it needs to be, you know, $61,000 like mm. the guys. If we go to 50-year-olds, so we're talking 10 to 15 years out of wish retirement, yep. the average balance is $130,000, which was consistent mm. with the other figure that we talked about. Yes. But they should have $271,000. And this is for what they call a comfortable retirement. Which is a half a million dollar retirement sum. Which is comfortable retirement is bugger all anyway. That's what they're saying. It's, it's, sort of, you know, I've mm. just looked at so much. It does vary a little bit, the mm. data that you're reading. It's somewhere between 500,000 and 750. Mm. Correct. Mm. But a 60 year old, 198,482 for men and 165,986 for women. But both of those categories are well over $200,000 behind where they should be. Mm. And that to me is a scary figure. But Considering we've got compulsory mm. superannuation, so how does that happen? Yeah, that's right. Because there should be enough going into their super to be able to have that as the gap as being zero, shouldn't mm. they? Shouldn't so obviously it? we're not putting enough away and that's why the government's increased it. Yeah. But it also highlights to me why you don't leave it to the government to make the decision. Correct. Do it yourself because the government gets it wrong all the time. Mm. Anything else you want to say on that or before? Yeah, I, I just wanted to look at mm. something. Like I'm, I haven't got anything to show, but mm. I just wanted to mention this that um, this is on a the Money Smart website, which you were looking at before as well. And I just mm -hmm. thought it'd be interesting to see the the savings targets um, for retirees. So so pre-retirees, the say there are savings targets. So it's something they should go and have a look at just to yeah. get a feel for this. But I'll just mention one. So say there's a couple, okay, and they're c considered um, that they – how much they would like to spend in retirement. So they're on the high end of the scale, let's say. They might spend, say, um, 3115 per fortnight. So that's 81000 a year. So they need a million dollars mm. um, to be saved so that by 65 years of age. Okay. Let's move that's on. That's at the high end. So there's like the low end was something like um, – mm -hmm. I think it was 111,000 or something like that. Um, if they were down at 48,000, but it's they'll just have to go in and have a good look at that because you've got savings targets for pre-retirees okay. and for retirees, which I thought's helpful. Well, according to uh, this, this other website I want to show now, it's called moneysmart.gov.au, which we talked about before. There's a um, retirement, the Superannuation Fund of Australia, estimate how much money you need in retirement depending on your lifestyle. Mm. So they're saying a couple, a modest lifestyle, is the annual living cost is forty three thousand. 
So is that by the time they get to what age? That's retirement. So, so 65 having, they're looking at or 70? Yeah. I, I haven't read all it the It depends what the... If they want a comfortable lifestyle at 66725 as a couple... Mm. So that's the money they need to f- per year, which is twelve hundred and seventy-eight dollars. Sounds about a week. Yep. If you're single, the modest lifestyle is thirty thousand, and that's if um, you know a comfortable lifestyle for single, forty-seven thousand. Mm. Now, to me, what does comfortable mean? It means you possibly you can pay your rent, you got food, da da da, but you can't have luxuries in life. But but it doesn't possibly. sort of add up to me based on the 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 mm. time. So the issue we had mm-hmm. some years ago was there was a lot of people coming out and telling, there were a lot of people in the industry telling people that they needed some astronomical mm-hmm. figure in order to retire, okay? Yeah. And then we, you and I saw this article by a guy that really made sense and he explained that if people actually do their numbers right and mm-hmm. look at what the curve is in terms of your expenses, because as you're getting to, as you're retiring, you're getting older, you're getting to your 70s, 80s, mm-hmm. your expenses drop off generally for most people because they're, they're not spending as much as what they were. They're not maybe traveling as much. Mm. They tend to be doing, a lot of people tend to be doing just less. Um, I know there's some extremely active 80 I year olds. I'm going to be spending I, more in retirement. That I know that. Um, because you've got more time to do stuff. Have an incredible life. When you but, work, you don't spend as but much. But this is what they they projected that, mm. that, um, that that's the spending curve drops off. And therefore, he was saying that it's the financial industry telling people that they need that money so they can get more money. <laughs> Well, yeah, right? but is, does the spending said, drop off because they don't have the money so they mm. naturally stop spending as much money because they're not bringing a wage in because they're scared He was of implying out. that they actually get become less active. That was his, not the retirees he was that I know. I think a lot of the retirees I know would want to be more active if they mm. had the money to do it, but that's possibly why they don't spend as much is because they don't have the money. They don't, they're worried about running out of money before they that's know, right. turn their toes up. So. Um, and also, yeah. these figures we've been talking about could assume yeah. that you're actually going to use all the money, mm. all yeah. of that saving. Correct. Mm. Which is so not what a lot. Which is what your point is, and a lot of people may not want mm. to do that because they may want to save something for their kids. Mm. Absolutely, they mm. can save for themselves because we teach them once they before. We'll teach the kids. Now mm. you've got a story that you found on this website, AMP, an AMP website. Yeah, I, there's do you an, want to read it out? Yeah, there's an interesting thing on that website, and it says. Um, they gave a case study of this person called Mac and he's 51, married um, and planning to retire at age 65. Now, to work out how much Mac might need in retirement, he tries their, uses their calculator. So they've got a calculator linked to the calculator and Mac's hoping for, now these sort of calculators you can get on the Money Smart website, I think as yep, well. Essex Money Smart, yep. Mac is hoping for a comfortable standard of living in retirement and the calculator estimates this will cost him $1,154 roughly a week or $60,000 a year. He's also planning on buying a new car and doing some traveling once retired and thinks he'll need $40,000 for these one-off expenses based on life expectancy of 81 years. Our retirement needs calculator estimates he'll need a total of $993,473 to fund his retirement. So how much um, might he have in retirement and how long is his money likely to last based on his current expected financial situation? Well, Mac uses their uh, retirement simulator Mm -hmm. and Mac currently has $172,000 in super. And that fits in with what you were saying before. Um, an annual pre-tax salary of 82000 which is close to that yep. um, average figure you mentioned, shares worth 20000 and the couple owns their family home, so Good. one house and a little bit of shares. Based on this information, our retirement simulator calculates he'll retire with savings of 294944 Based on his expected expenditure in retirement outlined above, um, our retirement simulator estimates his money will only last up to age 71 leaving him with a funding shortfall of 10 years in retirement. How scary is that? Isn't it? How scary. And that's, I'd say that's be a whole lot of Australians, mm. you know, and yeah. And the thing is people pay off their family home and don't invest because they go, I've got to pay off my family home. I go, mm. why? And they go, so I can get some security. I go, that doesn't give you security. That's right. Use the Having asset and start investing. That income. Don't have mm. to pay it. You use the income to get investments like shares and other property and then they'll help you pay the property off even faster but mm. use your property and leverage yourself. So Actually, it's yeah. interesting, isn't it? Because we're talking about that the income is going to give people security. Mm, correct. Right? Mm-hmm. But what happens in a GFC type event? 
people's capital all of a sudden is diminished. Yeah, it does, but they're short term. That's one or two. Their years. income will drop off mm-hmm. for their investments. For their investments, but not. But not they'll still continue to get. You can still to be get getting some dividend income. yields, and if you got rental property, you'll still be getting rental money. Yeah. So therefore, so. that's why people buy and hold, so they can continue to get that and mm-hmm. can't get out it because the their mindset is fixed mm-hmm. on getting that income, mm-hmm. and the capital is totally eroded. Yeah, but we don't have GFC style events every week or every year. It's, no, but yeah. they they repeat. They do repeat and on a cyclical so basis that we know the timing of that, so they can mm. be known when they're going to happen. Um, but again, it's like. Um, I'm showing a slide from ASIC's Money Smart website of some stuff where you're talking right. about living costs, you know. Again, for a modest lifestyle, you need at least 300. For comfortable lifestyle, single person, 544. For a couple, for a modest lifestyle, 431. Now, was that data 10 years ago? Or I think that? this data was about nine years yeah, ago. So yeah, so we just talked before about the figures. It was slide, more 60, 68,000 yeah, for a couple, I think you found before. I couldn't find the same slide on the, on the Money something. Smart website. Mm. But it's like three quarters of a million for a comfortable lifestyle, mm. um, and that's that's sort of scary. Well, there was something I found that said seven hundred and fifty thousand mm. will give you fifty thousand um, like in that, retirement, yeah. something like that. So the numbers are all pretty similar. So we're getting into the sexy stuff now. Okay, we're getting into more sexy stuff. I'm also looking at a, a superannuation calculator and just showing you the what happens with fees and etc. Mm. So. The graph I'm showing now says if you have a starting balance of twenty thousand dollars, you're on a fifty k salary. Actually, that's interesting because that was mm-hmm. um, was this the example? How old was Mac? Mac was fifty one, and he mm-hmm. had twenty thousand dollars in shares. Well, this is this is somebody starting at thirty, retiring at sixty five. Oh wow! So it's, it's not way Mac. ahead of Mac. It's not Mac. <laughs> so they've got twenty thousand dollars starting balance, fifty k salary, yeah. starting at thirty, retiring at sixty five, one percent fees on their superannuation. Yes, and this is on as I said. Uh, this super calculator, it says the fees you're paying in your current fund will cost you $41,564 of retirement. But would fees be the determining factor? Well, no, but what I'm what the slide is about is saying fees are important mm. to what you're actually doing. And the more fees you pay, the less you're going to mm. have at retirement. Mm. So it's just highlighting. A lot of people don't think about the fees in their super fund because they go, oh, they're low. So don't worry about it, but it just I would pays say that a lot of people print. don't know what the fees are in their super fund. No, they won't, and that's why I brought this up so they can actually look at it and go, "Well, what am I paying?" If you're paying two percent, then that's double. That's eighty-two thousand. Mm, but the other side to that is they may not know what the fees are, but I'd actually say it's like more important to have a look at how they're structured. That's the second in terms part of, of the it. investments. That Again, reduce split. cost, increase income. Mm. Do that. Don't do one or the other. Do both. Um, you know, reduce your costs or reduce your expenditure, increase your income. Yep. So if you can get half a percent less but fees, you see, in, in saying that, fees. that's what people have. Why people have gone to ETFs? Correct. So what do you say about that? But then they're not getting the growth. Well, are they or not? Not on. Not on the. Not but that, on the that's index not the, ones. the argument. Is that people sign up to ETFs thinking that they can be complacent and just leave the money set and forget? <laughs> that's what they think. Yeah. Well, it's all going to change after the next event. Yes. Well, I can click my heels and be in Kansas tomorrow. That'd be nice. Yeah. That's not going to work, is it? So you can't live in fairy tale land like that. All right. Um, golden so, rule number two. What's that one? Golden rule number two, invest wisely by following the economic cycle. So this is what we're talking about. Correct. This so now so we're getting important. into the exciting stuff. Investing in growth assets like direct shares and property. Yep. So mm. when do you do that? And we often say, you know, the, the old adage is time in the market and we go, that's rubbish, it's timing the market. Yep. If you get the right time, you'll get with the assets you buy, then you get the growth straight away. Mm. The industry keep pushing its time in the market that reads the orders be, and they say you can't time the market, which we know is BS because we do it yeah. all the time and our students do it all the time. So, But they want people just to go into these buy and hold scenarios and as you said, what happens when a GFC style event happens? Yep. You know, people get decimated. So we're showing people, showing everybody the, the economic clock. And this is something I came across 30, 40 years ago, mm. something like that. And it's really good. And it's not as cut and dried as it was back in the 80s and 90s. It's a little bit more muddy now. But did you want to take people through it? Look, I mean, I, I've looked at these recently. And like you say, it isn't cut and dry. And it depends on the economic clock that you're looking at because mm. they have there are some clocks that have actually been modified for the current times. But... Mm. You know, when you look at that right-hand side of the clock from 12 o'clock to around three to 3 o'clock. o'clock and you've got rising interest, falling share markets and falling commodity prices, well, you know, we're not in that 
we, we have had a falling stock market. We've but, had rising interest rates. But it wasn't, 12 o'clock supposed to be the peak. It, and it wasn't. So we, we haven't had that. We haven't right? had that. So it's just that everything seems to be a little bit out of whack in terms of. But it generally goes in that circular fashion if we, or if we look at, direction. Yeah, if we look at the falling commodity prices um, mm. part, that's really important because mm. all the big miners were falling into 2016. Mm. So that to me gives me a better idea of where things are at. So if that was three o'clock when everything bottomed out, um, decreasing overseas reserves, tighter money supply from four to six and falling real estate prices. Well, we, we did see that a, a bit. But a little bit. We, we've already had the correction. That was um, just mm. after the peak in the mm. GFC. We had that correction. Correct. We had it in COVID. So that's sort of a more um, much shorter t term one. These clocks are designed for these bigger cycles, not for those shorter ones. Correct. So between six and nine on the clock, we've got rising commodities, rising shares and falling interest rates. Because, I mean, right now we've, we're we pretty stable on the interest rates. I don't think if they go up, there might only be one more, maybe yeah. two, but that's probably about it. We and did, we didn't go into a depression. We didn't go into depression. The US did. The US did. Well, to an extent I anyway. Think, I think we're very much on that six to 12 side of the clock. I think we're not, we're not at that. We haven't been to the peak. Yeah. We've got to get to that sort of side of things. But, you know, from nine till 12, we've got rising real estate prices, easing money supplies, rising overseas returns. Because we're not, we don't have tight, we're, the, they're tightened down on some of the money a little bit, but not a lot. Yeah. Uh, and not like they, but when we get to the peak, it's when money's flowing everywhere. Mm. And that's what we haven't seen yet. So I think we're very much on that six to 12 side of the clock. And we're oh, look, I think we're closer to um, after the nine. That's just my thinking. Well, that's what I was thinking. I was we've had, probably closer nine to 12. We've had those massive rises in some of those commodities that mm. we've seen, mm. although there's still a lot of upside in a few, particularly copper and other ones that we mentioned on mm. our show recently. So um, rising shares, we know that the stock market is just poised to, to take rise. off again. Mm. And the falling interest rates. So yeah. we've already had that. We bring this up simply because we want people to go and you can, there's plenty of information out on this, on the economic cycle, economic clock. Yeah. Um, and so you can read up for people to focus on it. I know a guy that I know really, really well, a guy called Rod North. He's mm. written a book on it. He's a Melbourne bloke. Um, and he's got a website where he talks about this mm. in a lot more detail. So maybe you want to go and check out Rod's website. I actually should get in to buy me a coffee one day. Um, Look, I, I think good. about um, the article that we wrote years mm. ago and you might have written, I can't remember what I wrote and what you wrote in the end. I can't ever. But the, the best time to invest in 40 years, that was the best title that I think you came up with. That oh, yeah, title. that was me. But I don't know what you wrote in the article yeah. and how much I put but in. But that, yeah. that was like we're going to have another one of those that was at some an ASX, point. That, was, that came from an ASX presentation I did at mm. um, Melbourne Uni or RMIT in their auditorium. I did it for the ASX. I said this is the best time to yeah. invest. And we'll spot on with it. The, mm. the, the, whatever we did and, and we had people a couple of years later going, wow, mm. you know, it did happen exactly That's right. like you said. So it's, and I'm not saying that to pat myself on the back and beat my chest. I'm just saying it's if more you have about the just knowledge, recognizing, recognizing that there that, are cycles. where you are in the cycles mm. and understanding that the, the technical analysis and all mm. the other economic things, you can make these distinctions mm. and do better. So golden rule three is leave it alone, which we talked about. And so you leave it alone by allowing your investments to compound through reinvesting all profits and income. What do we mean by that? See, because that makes it sound like a buy and hold. It's not. It's not. It's not. So it still means you've got to have that kitty set aside mm -hmm. that you're using for your investments, whether yeah. it's going from one pot or the other Yeah. Um, is not the point because you're going to have to do that as we get into that next part of the cycle at some point when the market peaks out and a lot of the um, the, the equities are peaking out. Yep. So it's about that power of that compounding, there's no nothing like it, is there? Well, to me it's about like in a buy share, a sell shares for a profit, mm. and then that profit goes into the next shares mm. and it compounds the return. So if you start out investing 10% across the board, let's say you have 10 stocks, 10% in each, mm. if you sell one that's made 10% profit, it's doubled, sorry, doubled in price, then now you've got an extra. You've got extra cash You've got there. extra cash and if you're still doing yep. 10%, it's 10% now on a bigger amount. Mm. And then the next one you sell a profit, there's 10% on an even bigger amount. And yep. so that's the compounding we talk about. But I also talk about it in terms of if you get a tax return because you've done some good investing, mm. 
then that goes into investing or your dividends from your stocks, mm. you know, and people ask us about dividend reinvesting all the time. We don't do that. But what we do is we get the cash mm. and put that into our investing cash account and yep. then that goes into the next buys and, and we do that again. So mm. anything that comes from investment goes back into investment to a point in time where you start taking some of that for your lifestyle, which yep. is getting closer to retirement, I suppose. For some people, sometimes it is retirement. Some people, it's just little things along the way. Mm. Like we have students that might go out and buy themselves a new bike mm. or, you know, a motorcycle or, and they just use some of it because it's little rewards along the way that help keep you motivated too. So mm. it can be so important. But leave alone doesn't mean totally leave alone all the time. It just don't mean don't take too much out of it to stuff it all up. Yeah. Keep it growing so it could compound. That's good. What's the next little bit? Allowing your investments to compound through reinvesting all profits and income. Yeah, so the next bit is what? Um, it is better to overshoot than undershoot because once you have accumulated enough, you can use the surplus to fund your lifestyle. Yes. That sounds great, doesn't it? It is. It's Allowing better to your overshoot because you know you're there. Yeah, So, it, but that first point, which is more important, the first one or the next first one? First one. Yeah. First one, mm. definitely the first one. So now yeah. I'm going to show, I'm showing a couple of graphs now where we're doing, um, assuming $8,000 per year with a 7% return. So yep. I'm showing actually a graph over a period of 20 years and how it grows. So the total capital, if we have, if we invest $153.84 a week or $666.67 a month, we end up with $350,000. $921, assuming a, a return of 7%. Mm. So, you know, and to me, that just shows you the power. But the difference, so the total capital is 350921 But let's go to eight. Now we go to 10%. Mm. Same same figures, same weekly contributions. So you're starting else. off with how much? Um, 8K. Okay. Um, and then a 10% return means you got half a million dollars yep. over the 20 years. And that's so you're investing basically one hundred and sixty thousand mm. dollars on both of those, or your raw capital is one hundred and sixty. Yep. But getting ten percent over seven percent means you're going to get a shed load more money. You're up mm. a half a million dollars now. Getting ten percent on the stock market, we can do. Yep. You know, with I mean dividend and, and growth, you're mm. going to get ten percent. Mm. You know, you should be if you're an active investor or a trader, you unless should be able to get you that. get swamped by a GS, yeah, unless GFC you get swamped by GFC or COVID. and some other things. But mm. it just shows you what you can actually do. So let's keep moving on. This next yeah. example I want to show people is about the example of having a, a home and investment property and shares. And just to give people- Oh, this is so powerful. And it is really, really powerful in terms of, now the assumptions are the 7% property growth mm. and 10% share growth. So if we, and I've just used some, these are figures I haven't changed since nine or 10 years ago. So we've got a home, as initial value of a home was 400,000 and investment property was 400,000 and shares at 100,000. Now, obviously, yeah. property values have gone up in the last nine years. The average home in Melbourne is somewhere eight, nine hundred dollars 900000 mm. Sydney is probably a little bit more. But the growth is relative. Yes. And so we start out with $900,000 between $400,000 home, $400,000 investment property, and 100000 in shares. So that's 900000 So was the, were the dividends reinvested? Um, assumptions are just the growth. Okay. It's just growth, so it's not dividend reinvesting and everything. So we went from 900000 over 20 years mm. to $3.188 million. That's fantastic, isn't it? So it just shows you what you can do now. You know, if, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see the home. The value of the home is the blue bars, and then on top of that is the red one, which is your investment property, and the green is your shares, and just assuming those values. So, And that's 20 years. Mm. So if you're 30, you've got plenty of time to do so this. So just imagine what would have happened if – so mm. the, say the people bought the home, they mm. didn't buy the investment property, mm. and they didn't do any shares. Obviously, they just – because that money is just going to end up being spent, isn't it? Well, it is. If you've just got your, your home from 400000 to $1.5 million, well, then how do you spend the $1.5 million if you're living in it? Yeah, You've got to sell it to mm. realise the cash and then go and rent somewhere else or buy some small house mm. or a smaller property to live on the rest. And people are doing that and you reverse mortgages mm. of people's that I always had a show, a big flower and garden show a week or two ago here in Melbourne and there was a booth there for people with reverse mortgages. Right. You know, and to me it's like. What were they doing at a flower and garden show? 
<laughs> well, you could ask them, but I had no idea why they were there. It just didn't make sense to me. But they probably think more people in the retirement age go to those things. don't know. And mm. that's not saying anything about my age either. <laughs> um, it's my wife. We're looking at, you know, landscaping. So we, our landscaper was there. That's the only reason I went. Okay. And I'll stick to that story. Yep. <laughs> cool. Next thing I'm bringing up is the NAB, National Australia Bank Home Loan Calco. I want to show you some mm. really interesting things about an offset of how that can really affect paying off your loans. Mm. So this is assuming a $400,000 loan, an interest rate of 5.88, which is not, this was as nine years ago. So it's pretty close to what we're at now. Yes. So 5.88, loan term 30 years, and we paid monthly. That's all we did. We paid that monthly. Um, and we're looking at the the minimum monthly repayments are two thousand three hundred sixty-seven forty-three, um, and that's what it was over thirty years. And you can see the rate it had took thirty years to pay that off. Basically, just paying the monthly payments, mm. like the bank said. That's all it was. If we then go in and combine, make an extra contribution of one hundred dollars, just yep. one hundred dollars of every month. Now, what we've done, and we've we saved over, we saved three years in time. Well. Wow. And it's $53,912 That's in fantastic. cash. That's fantastic. Just by adding an extra $100 a month mm. to the mortgage repayment. Same, as I said, this is a NAB home loan calculator. Yep. Now, so paying, an, oh, sorry, it was an extra $200 a month. Sorry. It means 95000 And yeah, paying $200 a month means $95,169 and an interest in, in interest in five years and five months, you save off your time. Now, wouldn't you like to pay your home off faster? That's amazing. Add an extra hundred or two hundred dollars mm. to it. So, continue to make the same monthly repayments in the remaining time. You would have saved an extra over thirty years, one hundred and sixty, nearly one hundred sixty-seven thousand dollars. Excellent. Is that? That's how you're going to retire. That's what it's doing, isn't it? Now, what I've done here is just use use the same calculator, but put an offset account of ten thousand dollars on there. Mm. So, with the offset. The loan term, it actually saved us one year and six months and it saved us $45,000 just by putting $10,000 into an offset. Yep. How's that? That's excellent. You've got to save that 10000 obviously. Yeah, you just put it in an offset account, but yeah, mm -hmm. correct. So this is how things you can do. So to me, it's, it's really, really important that people learn how to invest in stocks. Mm -hmm. And trade if they do do so. And we, First we, of all, it's important they learn how to save and mm -hmm. pay themselves and save. Correct. And, and then build up a bit of cash so they can invest. Correct. And everybody should be starting there. You know, mm -hmm. the thing is it's just sit down and spend a little bit of time on it. Look, some it can, people can even set up their, their wage and get the employer yeah. to pay it into a separate account. So they should. It's a forced saving. Sometimes you have your bank sweep your bank account into mm -hmm. another one and don't touch it. Yep. Um, those sorts of things. But as you, because you know, anybody can buy $1,000 worth of shares. You save up mm -hmm. $1,000, put it into some blue chip shares. Just yep. keep doing that. Mm -hmm. Just keep doing it. Great. So you get enough and then you're building that up and then you use the deposit for house and for so investment you, property. So you've got oh. set some goals. So this is the summary of what we just talked a bit about. So mm -hmm. set your goals. Make sure yep. you've got a roadmap, that is. Yep. Pay yourself first. Important. Very important. You're more important that, than your that tax That is man. before tax, pay yourself first. Correct. Reduce bad debt like credit cards and even your own home, the interest on your own home that you're paying. Can I ask um, you a question before you move on? Of the successful people, financially successful people, you know, how many of them have bad debt? I think at some stage they all did. I'm saying they all may have. I'm not all saying did. they had credit card debt, but, no, but they all had a home have, with a mortgage. How many of them have? Yep. Obviously, let's let's exclude 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 a home with a mortgage on it. Then why are you doing that? Because I'm just saying I don't know any success financially successful people that have bad debt. I don't either, but the sad mm. thing is that if people did, I don't think they'd tell you. Yeah, they would. I've got friends. We're pretty open. No, you, you said know? of the people that you know. doesn't mean your well, closest yeah. friends. Well, well, if I don't know them, I don't know them, do I? But you know what I mean? It's like successful, financially successful to to people bite. don't have bad debt. No. They may have bought a house when they were younger, like, mm. you know, in their 20s or 30s or whatever else and got married and they had that. But and that's what everyone did. The more successful, they, they mm. learned how to do this. Create multiple streams of income. That's a cool. One. Mm. If you want to retire early, do this. Mm -hmm. Just do that. Um, invest at least ten percent of your income into growth assets. Yep. I'd say twenty percent, but mm -hmm. you know, but ten percent minimum. Last one we got there, we didn't even talk Use about leverage. today. You mentioned it a few times, and that is well, obviously, obviously that person. We, we did this scenario with one house, one investment property. It's mm. using leverage to get it. Correct. Initially, so do so. That, but don't pay your house off first and then start to invest. As mm. you're earning equity in your home, 
use that to buy an investment property or use mm. that to get into the stock market. And people go, yeah, but the stock market's risky. Well, no, it's not. Well, you don't want to wait, you know, how many of your years it's mm. going to take to pay off your home to get there. I mean, I was fortunate in that I didn't have many years to pay it mm. off. But, mm. you know, a lot of people are looking down the barrel of a 20, 30-year mortgage. Well, they are, you know. I mean, it's a Buffett that said investing without knowledge is gambling. Mm. Or is that me? Or both of us? <laughs> Probably both of us. Um, but it, it's so many people. And investing in the share market's not gambling mm. if you know what you're doing. Investing in property is not gambling if you know what you're doing. Mm. Investing in cash is anybody can do. That's right. So, but to me it's about, you know, set your goals, pay yourself first, get rid of your bad debt. Create and we'd love to hear income. about it too. Oh, yeah, if absolutely. Being able to turn yourself around, I'd absolutely love anybody to Anybody can it. do this and that's the point that I wanted to get with these two podcasts, the last one yeah. we did and this one is that, doesn't matter where you start, it's matter where you finish that counts. It doesn't matter mm. how old you are. Like you said, can you retire in 10 years? Yeah, you can. It just, you've got to see, do what we've just talked about. Mm. Now, we haven't talked about actually buying and selling stocks and buying and selling property in terms of how people do that. Because, you know, we can teach people about the stock market and there are property people out there with property to help people un understand investment. But it's the principle behind the what principle you're doing. The behind it. Yeah. So, but hopefully you've enjoyed this podcast, that the two podcasts that Janine and I have done on this subject and, you know, we really do hope you got a lot out of it and, and we really do want to hear people's success stories and as Janine said, you know, we do want to help people. So, and this was part of a presentation that Janine and I did like nine years ago, um, which we used to call, we used to do seminars called The Art of Trading for our students and this was one of them that we've broken up into mm -hmm. three parts. So, um, so you would have, the first part was the mood in the market. And obviously these two parts were really, what are the goals and how are you going to achieve all your goals, um, et cetera, or you're getting that lifestyle mm -hmm. goals, how are you going to retire comfortably? So for some people, hopefully we've scared them enough to take a step forward because, and we don't mean to scare you, like freaks you out and you just do nothing. Um, it's just to say, there's the reality of life. You, the future is yours, but you have to choose the right way and move forward through that future, make the right decisions now, because one thing we know we're going to buy, we're going to, with birth, deaths and taxes. And um, how you live your life will depend on the choices you make today. But And just sit mm. at home mm. um, at night mm. before you go to bed, get before a piece of pen, paper and a pen or use your mm. notes in your phone yeah. and just jot down three things that you're going to do to get yourself on the road to doing what it is or achieving your goals. Do tomorrow or is it just... Don't, well, don't Did put off till tomorrow what you can do today. So every, yeah. at night, yeah. sit down and document Smart. three things that you can start doing now. Don't watch now the TV. Towards that. Don't watch the TV. Oh, I wouldn't say that altogether. Don't watch the TV. That's three <laughs> things I'm not going to do. Don't watch the TV. <laughs> no, I didn't say three things you're not going to do. I said three things you're going to do. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay, that's different. Set your goals, budget, all that sort of stuff. But anyway, mm. that's it for us here on Talking Wealth. I really do hope you've enjoyed our podcast for this week. But as always, Jenny and I, you know, we're quite happy to talk about whatever subject you'd like. If you do want to talk to, you know, give some ideas to Janine and I to talk about, just shoot them through to info at wealthwithin.com.au. As I said, if you're listening to this as a podcast on your way to work or home from work or on your morning walk with your dog, Get onto YouTube, um, talk, go to YouTube, Wealth Within TV, and you'll see the recording of this, and you'll be able to see all the charts and the websites that we did look at so you can really get the most out of this podcast. Um, if you do want to copy my book, still go to our website, wealthwithin.com.au, and you can get my first book for free. You just got to pay the shipping. And if you do want to, uh, thinking about getting educated in the stock market, maybe give us a call and talk to one of our team, and they'll help you decide if a course is relevant, relative, relative, relevant, relevant to you, and then they'll help you select which one's more relevant and then, you know, when and how you're going to fund it and everything else, that's all down the track. But right now it's about investigating what could be your future. But that's it for me. I've been enjoying your presence today and your comments. So thank, thank you, you very much for that. What a great um, idea for a podcast. Thanks for that. No, that's my pleasure. So you've been listening to Janine Cox, the Senior Analyst here at Wealth Within. I'm Dale Gillam, the Chief Analyst. Goodbye, good luck and good trading. Talk to you next time.